Bibles out and get your outlines out and turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and as you recall, we are going through the book of Romans, the premier of spiritual doctrine, the premier of wonderful salvation truth. If you want to understand what salvation is and what happened to you when you were saved, gloriously and wonderfully saved, you need to read the book of Romans. Some have suggested that Romans is uh, even more challenging than the book of the Revelation because of the depths that it goes into. I don't know about that, but I do know that as you and I get into the book of uh, Romans and read it and see what God has to say through his apostle Paul, we understand so much about why we are who we are. You know, you've heard me say throughout this series that uh, uh, Romans is a book uh, about sin. It's also a book about salvation. It's also a book about sanctification. In other words, uh, God reminds you and me, tells you and me, uh, about the reality of our sinful nature. He goes through that step by step, uh, Romans 1 through 3, 4. And then uh, he reminds us of what can happen through the wonderful gift of God. And we're going to be looking at that. And then on over, he'll talk about uh, sanctification. Do you ever ask yourself, why is man the way that he is? Why are we the way we are? Why do we do what we do? Why, whenever you turn on the evening news or the morning news or whatever news you listen to, why is man always involved in wickedness, ungodliness, uh, killing, death, so many things. Charlotte and I will get up on in the morning and uh, one of our uh, normal routines, we'll turn on uh, the early news and we'll see what has gone on throughout the night. And usually it's not somebody handing out Bibles to someone or it's not somebody uh, encouraging somebody and uh, driving them home uh, uh, you know, with their groceries or anything like that. But usually it's shooting and killing and stabbing and so much of that. My mother used to always say, said, uh, now, uh, you need to be in before, before 12 o'clock because nothing good happens after 12 o'clock, mostly. And there's a lot of truth in that. But, you know, you look at Romans, and in the early part of Romans, we've looked at the reality of sin and uh, the results of sin, what it has done to mankind to the point that he doesn't want God in his mind, doesn't want God in his heart, doesn't want God in his thinking. But then it's impacted the religious people. It's impacted religious circles to the point that the Jews would look at those who were uh, out, of, uh, out of the grace of God. And they'd look at them and say, aha. And then Paul said, no, you're just the same way. You live the same way. You walk the same way. And so Paul has been previously talking about, and prior to chapter 5, about the fruit of sin. What happens as a result of our sinful nature? But when you get to chapter 5, and especially to this section, Paul is going to be talking about the root of sin, the entrance of sin into the human race. You know, sometimes you'll hear somebody say something to you like, why did God let this happen? Or why do I have this disease? Or why is this happening? I came across a young man yesterday in making my rounds, and I don't know if it was his mother, stepmother, or who it was, but he said, you just need to claim in the name of Jesus your help. You just need to claim in the name of Jesus your healing. And as I stood there, I just thought, that's wonderful and that's good, but we're still going to get sick. We're still going to age and we're still going to die even if you're in Jesus Christ. Why? Because of Romans chapter 5, what God says through his servant Paul in Romans 5. So follow along with me in your outline. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned against after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But now... As of the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one man, of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. 
For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offense unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one man, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, as you read that in the King James Version, you may find a little bit of a challenge in understanding some of those realities and principles and truths. So follow along in the reading of the Living Bible. It simplifies it a great, great deal. Listen to it very carefully. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. His sin spread death throughout all the world, so everything began to grow old and die. We know that it was Adam's sin that caused this, because although, of course, people were sinning from the time of, Mo of Adam until Moses, God did not in those days judge them guilty of death for breaking his laws, because he had not yet given his laws to them, nor told them what he wanted them to do. So when their bodies died, it was not for their own sins, since they themselves had never disobeyed God's special law against eating the forbidden fruit as Adam had. What a contrast between Adam and Christ, who was yet to come. And what a difference between man's sin and God's forgiveness. For this one man, Adam, brought death to many through his sin. But this one man, Jesus Christ, brought forgiveness to many through God's mercy. Adam's one sin brought the penalty of death to many, while Christ freely takes away many sins and gives glorious life instead. The sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to be king over all. But all who will take God's gift of forgiveness and acquittal are kings of life because of this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's sin brought punishment to all, but Christ's righteousness makes men right with God. So that they can live. Adam calls many to be sinners. Because he disobeyed God. And Christ calls many to be made acceptable to God. Because he obeyed. The ten commandments were given. So that all could see the extent of their failure. To obey God's law. But the more we see our sinfulness. The more we see God's abounding grace. Forgiving us. Before. Sin ruled over all men. And brought them to death. But now God's. Kindness rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I recognize that's a little longer passage, but it's important that you and I see it so we can see the reality of the human entrance into sin. Now, you remember that, I, as I mentioned, Paul has been dealing with the fruit of sin, and now he's talking about the root of sin. Where did everything come from? Where did all evil begin? On this earth. Now, let me say this. Evil did not begin with Adam. Uh, Adam is the only one who introduced it onto the earth. Satan has always been evil and always sinned and always disobeyed God. Uh, well, after he fell and, you know, left his holy and happy estate. Now, Paul makes it clear that Adam is the representative. Now, how so is Adam the representative? Because the reality of it, every one of us were in Adam. If you had a giant uh, recorder that could rewind and fast forward and that had the time span of about 6,000 years and you could rewind, you would find yourself at whatever age you are and then you get younger and younger and younger and younger and then you would go back into your uh, mother's womb and she would, you know, get younger and younger and reverse, reversing and reversing and reversing. And so that's exactly what Paul is making very clear. We were all in Adam. You were in Adam. I was in Adam. All the human race was in Adam. And so Paul is making it clear that Adam is the representative of ruined humanity. Why is humanity ruined? Why is mankind wicked? Why is mankind rebelling? Because of the reality and the entrance of sin into, into the world. 
Man cannot uh, uh, better himself. He cannot do any better because he's sinful. You know, we have a lot of talk shows that they try to help people and they probably do some good. But you cannot eradicate the human, the sinful nature. It is impossible. As a matter of fact, you're going to have part of that nature until you leave this world and go out to be with the Lord. And so, uh, you remember in Adam, all men are sinners. We're sinners. That's why we need a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In Christ, we're saints. You know, God, by the way, did you know that God never called a redeemed person a sinner saved by grace? You know, uh, sometimes we'll hear a song, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Do you know you'll never find that phrase in the New Testament? Do you know that it's not even there? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Why? Because God don't call you sinners. God calls us saints. And so, and so that's exactly what takes place. I like what I heard a godly teacher say one time. He said, you banish Adam from the scheme of things, and Romans 5 must be torn from the Word of God. Why? Because it is dealing with the, the reality of sin into this world through Adam. And, uh, you know, you stop and think about it. You know, we're living in a world of sickness and sin and death. As a matter of fact, it's said that there's 60 million people that die every year. Two of those die every second. I heard a coroner of a coroner one time whenever he would sign a letter to anyone, here's the way he would put it. He wouldn't sign sincerely or cordially. He would say, eventually yours. In other words, he was letting people know that somewhere down the road, his services are going to be needed. So Paul is making it clear to the Romans, to the saints of God, because, listen carefully, if you don't get a good understanding of sin and the entrance of sin, we can misunderstand what is going on in this world. You know, we can say, why don't God stop everything? Well, the reality of it is sin has got to reach its apex. That's why God will not stop it. Sin has got to reach its full maturity, and that full maturity will take place in the Battle of Armageddon Sunday when sin has reached its culmination, has reached its apex, and God takes control, and He does what He chooses to do in the end time. So let's look at the problem of sin. Notice uh, exactly what Paul stated. He made it very clear what the reality. He said the presence of sin. You know, he, he just simply makes it very clear, very realistic. You know, the story of Adam and Eve is not a figment of imagination. It's not some fairy tale. You know, and it's amazing what people say. Well, you know, I heard a fellow the other day, he was a scientist. He said, you know that we have disproved the Bible. And uh, I was listening to try to argue against uh, Dr. Robbie Zachariah. If you've never heard of Dr. Ravi Zechariah, or if you've never Googled Dr. Ravi Zechariah, or listened to him, you need to listen to him. He is one of the greatest apologetics uh, in our day and time. Because whenever he got finished, this young man didn't have an argument, uh, didn't have a leg to stand on. And the reality of it is the, the story of Adam. It's, it's the story of the fall of mankind. Why? Because he sinned. He disobeyed God. How many dis acts of disobedience? One. And what does it take for you to be a sinner? Well, how many times do you have to break a limb for it to be broken? One time. And so uh, Adam both represented us and he contained us. That's why you're a sinner. You're a sinner by nature. You're a sinner by practice. Uh, you know, you sin because you're a sinner. That's simply who we are. Uh, I like uh, what I heard someone say. Nature is like a, an infectious blood disease. Whatever the nature is, it's passed on down to the next generation. Have you ever seen somebody, one time my uncle went to a, a doctor and he was having foot problems. And the doctor just simply said, real simply, he said, well, you probably got a lot of foot problems. I bet you some more in your family have got foot problems too. He said, at your next homecoming, why don't every one of you take your shoes off and compare feet? Well, they didn't do that. But what he was saying is this, you know, uh, first time my mother looked at my dad's feet, she laughed. Uh, and uh, because... Just, you know, I guess maybe what she thought they looked like. Because, you know, you, you look back and you see certain genetic traits. Law, my, uh, sometimes when I hear my own self walk, I walk so much like my dad, I almost want to turn around and look. But that's exactly our nature. And, and that's exactly what took place. Adam's sin nature was passed on to you. Now, in part of the text, it makes it very clear that 
You know, from Adam, listen carefully, to Moses, people died, but they died because the sin nature was on the inside of them. They hadn't had the Ten Commandments. They didn't know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. Well, why did they die then? They died because sin was a reality in their body. And so that makes it very simple to understand. You walk with God, you follow God, you do whatever God tells you to do, and you're still going to die, right? Because the sin principle is inside of you. It has nothing to do with your walk with God. And sadly, so many people will say something like, well, you know what, you just pray in the name of Jesus. Folks, that will not happen because you're, we are sinful and that's simply the way it is. And so, you know, you look at the, the presence and not only that, but look at the penalty. You know, the Bible makes it very clear. Death was the penalty. And uh, the moment Adam sinned, he died. Now, watch this. Adam did not fall over dead. And some would say, now, wait a minute. That shows you the Bible's not true. That uh, Adam died, but he's still alive. So the Bible's not true. Well, there's a number of different types of death. First of all, there's a death in relationship. Have you ever had a death in a relationship with somebody? They walked away from you. They sinned and rebelled. And you wanted to have the relationship, but the relationship was dead. Why? Because of what they did. And that's exactly what Paul is making very clear. When Adam sinned, he died in his relationship to God. There was no more fellowship with God. There was no more intimacy with God. Adam absolutely broke what was there. And so, you know, so Scripture makes it very clear. That death and dying are a byproduct of sin. You're, you're going to die unless there's the rapture. And I've been around long enough that I've had people say, you know, Pastor, pray that this person gets better. Pray that this person who's 89 years old and has heart problems, oh, pray for it that he gets better. Folks, that's not going to happen. We are flawed. We are human. We are sinful. And we're going to die. That is the curse of sin. It was passed on to you. You'll pass it on to your children. They'll pass it on to their children. As long as time stands, there will be the penalty of sin. And by the way, notice it doesn't say sins. As by one man's sin. It doesn't say sins. So what do you mean sins? When you're talking about sin, you're talking about the income of a fallen disposition. In other words... Not the actions, but the nature. You know, we're all fallen. And so we have a fallen nature. The sin nature, the sin principle. You know, since you got saved, have you ever thought, now, I'm saved, I'm a child of God, why do I think that? Why does that thought go through my mind? I must not be walking with God, because if I was walking with God, I wouldn't have any of those, any of those thoughts, right? Wrong. Listen to what Paul says. We wrestle. Now let me give you an example. I'm not going to do it because he's bigger than I am, taller than I am. Let's suppose I got Brother Terry down here. And I said, Brother Terry, let's wrestle for a little bit. I ain't going to do it. But remember when you as a kid, you'd wrestle with some, some of your friends? You'd just wrestle just to pass time. Do you realize that's what Paul is saying? There's that wrestling, there's that struggle, there's that... Always that intensity. Why? Because we want to walk with God and Satan wants to pull us. That is the reality. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of wickedness in high places. The satanic trinity. Do you realize that there is the divine trinity, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost? There is a satanic trinity. Principalities, powers, and rulers of wickedness. And so, notice that it's sin. Not just, not sins. Now, I want you to notice something. Death has three manifestations. First of all, spiritual death. What is spiritual death? It's what you were born into this world. You were born separated from God. You were born alienated from God. There is not a single person that was born saved. I know some people have said, you know, I've been a Christian for as long as I can remember. Since I was just a little bitty kid. Well, if you don't have a time that you can remember you made a confession of faith in Jesus Christ, then you need to clear that up. Because you've not always been saved. There was a time you admitted and owned up that you was a sinner or you're not saved. 
And then there's that spiritual death. You know, spiritual death, separation, and physical death, rather, I mean. Physical death, we're going to die. And then eternal death. That's where uh, the Bible makes it very clear. Every lost person that dies, that's an eternal death. They're not, they're not going to live. That's, that's exactly what Scripture says. So before Adam and Eve, you know, uh, sinned, they walked with God. The Bible says they were naked and not ashamed. There was no conscious awareness because they, they were not sinning. They were walking in holy harmony with God. And so they sin brought shame. It brought hiding from God. By the way, do you notice that every time that we sin, it brings shame? And we try to hide from God somewhat. You know what I'm talking about? No, I didn't do that. You know, we can try to emotionally hide. Some people won't come into the church building because they're trying to hide from God. Or whenever they come in, they're expecting the sky to fall or the ceiling to fall because they're afraid for some reason. And so it results in shame and hiding from God. But look at the power of sin. Notice, notice what he says. He said, makes it very clear. You know, when you look at it, the world sin from Adam, as I mentioned, to Moses. And they sin because of their sinful nature. Men died because sin was passed from Adam. Passed to the next generation, the next generation. But here's something that I've, I've often wondered about. Now you remember how old people lived in the Old Testament, right? How old was the oldest person in the Bible? Does anybody know? And what was his name? Methuselah. Okay, how old was he? I'm hearing some mumble, but I'm not hearing a definite answer. 969 years old. Can you imagine that? Guys, we're just babies if we was in the Old Testament. I mean, imagine. We're not even started off. 969. And some people say, well, now, you know that really wasn't accurate. Well, first of all, if that's not accurate, God's lied. And uh, there, some have suggested that after the flood, there was some Noachic... Uh, Tumult that resulted as a result of the flood and so changed things. But anyway, the, the power of sin. Men died. And, uh, you know, when you stop thinking about it, the power of sin is pretty. It don't happen just to adults. It happens to babies. And, and there's a lot of things we don't understand. I've had the sad reality that I've had to be in a funeral and to preach the funeral of a little baby. A little baby was killed in a car accident. I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember going up to that little bitty box where that little baby was in a car seat and somebody hit the, hit the car and rear-ended and I think maybe the child's neck was broken. But here's that little bitty box. Had that baby done anything worthy of sin? And the reality about it is there's a thousand questions, but, but the power of sin, it takes all age groups, takes every age group, takes the righteous, the wicked, the godly, the godless, it takes the rich, it takes the poor. And so... You know, and so Paul makes it very clear we're, we're sinners. The presence of sin, the penalty of sin, and the power of sin. You know, and, and the reality about it is, you know, we want to be healthy. We need to be healthy. Matter of fact, the Bible commands us and directs us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so we need to watch what we eat. We need to watch how much we eat. But still yet, with all of that, we're going to die. And, and so I say this, and, and Paul says it more so, so you and I can give an answer to those, that, well, what did he do? You remember in the New Testament, what happened to this man that he was born blind? Did his mom sin, dad sin, or did he sin? Why was he born blind? Somebody comes to you and says, well, why did this person die? What did he do to deserve death? Folks, we're under the sin principle. No matter what we say, no matter what we want to believe, the reality of the truth of the Word of God is we are under the reality of sin, the power of sin, the penalty of sin, and, you know, as well as the presence of sin. And so Adam transferred death. But there's something else that this text reveals. How long ago did Adam live? Does anybody know? I read an article and it was very intriguing. A person who, I guess, was very gifted with genealogy and study and biblical lineage and all that, 
and tracing timetables back and back and back and back. He said that uh, according to what he calculated, that the world began in October of 4006 B.C. Now, I don't know if that's accurate, but I can tell you this. There is no biblical evidence that this earth is 10 million years old. It's simply not there. There's no biblical evidence that this earth is 20 million years old or 30 million. There's no biblical evidence this world is a million years old. Now, you say, well, you know, there's th things that predate the Bible. Well, I hear what you're saying, but when God said, in the beginning, God. How far do you go back before in the beginning? You can't predate in the beginning. And so, the reality of it is, Adam, watch this. Adam has infected you 4,000 years ago or more. He has impacted your life because, watch this, you will impact lives that you'll never see or never watch or never witness or never behold. You'll impact them. How do you know that? You're impacting your son, your daughter. They're impacting somebody else's life. They're impacting somebody else's life. And they're going by what? The way you lived and behaved. And, and that's one of the principles in this passage. How Adam impacted a world by his action, his disobedience, and his sin. It's not just about sin, though it is about sin. But it's about his action. You know, we've got a saying... And it's one of the silliest sayings that I guess I've ever heard. I mean, it's absolutely foolish. And you've heard it just as soon as I say it. Well, now my life is my business. I can do what I want to with my life. That is about as preposterous of a statement. You know why? Nobody is an island. No one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. You will a person... Even if they don't have any children, if they don't have a husband or wife, they impact people's lives. So, look at the problem of sin satisfied. Now, you'll notice beginning in verse 15 that uh, Paul takes a, a little bit different turn. He says, but, I love that. I love when a verse starts with the but, but, not as the offense, so also is the free gift. In other words, since all the family of the human race is in Adam, since all the family of the human race has sinned because of Adam's sin, we are sinful. He passed on that genetic reality to us. You know, if that was all there was to the end of the story, we'd all be doomed. We'd all be damned and we're all going to hell. Live what you, however you want to live. Behave because we don't have any hope. That's not what Paul said. And it's almost as though Paul is trumpeting this wonderful truth that's found in verse 15. Watch. Listen to it very carefully. He said, As by one man, the offense of one, many be dead, much more by the grace of God, the gift by grace, which is by the one man, Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is trumpeting. I want to tell you, the problem of sin is satisfied. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not going to sin. But it means that my sin has been paid for, for all who are in Christ Jesus. Watch uh, how he puts it. You know, God provided the ultimate gift. First of all, notice, God's gift releases us from bankruptcy. Now, what does it mean we're bankrupt? We don't have any way of paying for our sin. We have nothing to pay for our sin. First of all, we don't want to pay for our sin. Someone was asking a preacher one time, they said... Preacher, why is this man doing, living wicked, behaving wicked, walk? And it seems like it don't bother him one iota. And I mean, he was doing all sorts of things. He said, well, young man, let me just ask you a question. Suppose you've got a dead man. And you put a 400-pound weight on a dead man. Does it bother him? No. That 400-pound weight isn't going to bother a dead man any more than people who are living and walking wickedly. And we live in a sea of I mean, it's nothing to hear people say, well, I believe it's all right to live together. You can believe what you want to believe. It's wrong. You can say what you want to say. Your belief is not the final say. God is the final say. But why do people feel like it's all right? Because they're dead. They're dead in trespasses and in sin. 
And they don't feel anything wrong about it. They don't feel any guilt about it. Why? The same way that 400 pound weight don't bother a, a dead man. And that's why whenever God quickens a person and he convicts the person and he moves in their life, they start realizing their sin, their sinfulness, and they realize what they're doing and they cry out to God. God redeems them. That's what happened to Paul the Apostle. He was whipping people, doing everything he could to people, and God moved in his heart and God awakened his soul and Paul was redeemed gloriously. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. So God releases us from bankruptcy. Now watch this. You're going to die in Adam. The best you can hope for in Adam is death. How many funerals have you been to in your life? How many viewings have you been to? Mom and Dad taught me early in life how to behave whenever I went to Shoemate Funeral Home in Littlesboro, Kentucky. They said, now whenever you go in, you be on your best behavior. They said, there'll be a register right there. They said, you sign your name and uh, you don't get into any trouble. Usually something was said about not getting into any trouble. I liked Shoemate Funeral Home because they had the Coke machine in the back and you could pull that Coke out. Do you remember that? You put it out to the end and then pull it up. It was in some ice water. One, uh, one family in the church, they got the register, and after they had gone home and looked through the register, they called Mom. They, I didn't realize, but they said, Miss Bush, I just want to tell you that Benny went through and he signed the register about four or five, six times. I was under the assumption that every time you went out, you came back in and you signed it. Well, the reality about it is we all have, have been there. We've been to visitations. We've been to funerals. But think about it. No matter how you dress a person up, they're still what? Dead. No matter what they look like, they're dead. And that's exactly what Adam gives you and me. He gives us death. He gives us curse. He gives us sin. He gives us annihilation. I mean, we're going to be destroyed. You know, Christ brought forgiveness. Think about it. Adam brought death. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, he brought forgiveness. Where Adam brought death, Christ brought life. That's why, listen, where there is a true New Testament church, listen carefully, there ought to be a whole lot of laughing and a whole lot of fun going on. Why? Because we're redeemed. Think about it. If the earth, there's an earthquake that splits this church right in the middle, man, we're all going out of here. We're going to glory. I mean, far better than any than any uh, trip to Hawaii or Bahamas or Caribbean. I mean, we're going to glory. So God's people ought to, ought to laugh. They ought to have joy. Why? Because we're not bankrupt anymore. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And you've heard me say this before. You need to say it to yourself. My dad runs the world. Why? Because it's the truth. And it helps you get through this world when it really hits hard sometimes. So... You know, that's been accomplished in, in Christ Jesus. You know, sin brought prison. Salvation brings paradise. Sin brought devastation. Salvation brings deliverance. Sin brought, uh, you know, I mean, brought pain. But God gives wonderful privilege through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, not only that, but God's gift releases us from blame. Oh, I love that. You know... Adam's one sin. Now notice that the Bible says his one sin. One sin. You see, we are so warped and perverted that sometimes we'll say, well, how many sins do you have to commit to, uh, for it to really be bad? Well, let me ask you a question. How many hand grenades have to go off in your right hand to really hurt you? I've heard of some people who've had that. I heard of an old timer some years ago. And he didn't know what he had. But he had this long, looked like a tool. But come to find out it was an old, dated grenade. And he was using it for a nutcracker. Well, he finally got rid of that nutcracker and got him something else. Can you imagine what would have happened? But, you know, and, and you start to think millions are living under bondage. Why don't people laugh? Why don't people smile? Why do people talking about somebody? Because the, the sin bondage. They're dead in trespasses and in sin. And they live wickedly. They talk wickedly. They behave. Because there's no freedom. 
And the gift of God releases us from blame. How so? Jesus Christ took your penalty. He took my penalty. He took all of my sin. The sin principle. The, I mean, he took all of my sin. And he died on the cross and executed. And his execution and his death, mine went with him. And so, a person who is cleansed by Christ, we don't have to live in blame. Can I tell you one of the things that I find and discover from time to time? People live guilty. People live in blame. People live, you know, as the old saying goes, lower than a snail in a wagon track. I mean, they, they live low. We ought to live high. Why? Not because we're somebody in and of ourselves, but because we're somebody through Jesus Christ. And we are somebody. And so he's taken away our sin. Adam brought bondage. Christ brought freedom. And we need to enjoy that freedom. We need to be reminded. Our, listen, our faith is not about a religious system, codes and all of that. It's not how many times you wash your hands like the Pharisees. You remember they had so many codes. As a matter of fact, I believe it was 611 uh, laws that they went by. They had ceremonial laws. They had uh, clerical laws. They had all sorts of laws. One law, you couldn't walk over three quarters of a mile on the Sabbath. And if you did, you violated that. You remember what uh, uh, Jesus did? He went into the temple and uh, ate the showbread. And they really came down on him for that. Why? Because they were legalistic. Listen, we've been freed from that. We've been released from blame. And that's exactly what the problem, it's been satisfied. And so Christ's death is so complete. God yearns for us to walk in, in true, wonderful, glorious freedom. As a matter of fact, I want you to notice, and, and, and out of Romans 5, 16. Sometimes when you wonder if you've been forgiven, look at it on the overhead. Christ freely takes away many sins and gives glorious life and said, takes away, takes away. Have you ever had somebody take away something bad of yours and replace it with something good? I, had, I met a person the other day. I was getting green beans from her. And uh, somebody didn't take away something bad, but she came and she had a brand new car. And I called her by name. I said, it looks like you've got a brand new car. She said, no, this isn't mine. This is my brother-in-law's. But she said, you wouldn't believe how I got it. Said he was, I think, given blood, Kentucky Blood Bank. And, you know, they put your name in a little hat and all that. And somebody wins something. They called him and said, Mr. So-and-so. Said, I want to tell you, you've won a prize. And they thought, well, what the prize? Well, he won a brand new 19, or 2017 Toyota Camry. Now think about it for a moment. Well, you say, wow, that, that's good. But, but notice, Christ freely, look at that second word, freely takes away many sins. Didn't have to. Nobody made him. He freely. And folks, that's why we ought to be full of grace and kindness and mercy to people we meet across the pathway of life. People are going to say things to you, say rotten things to you, and do rotten things. Listen, you remember what the Bible says in, in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love for us while we were sinning. Christ died for us. And so he takes away. Don't allow yourself to be beaten down with your sin because sometimes we go back and you ever pulled up a sin in the past and just beat yourself up over it? I know I did this or I know I behaved that way or I know I shouldn't have done this. That's not what God wants us to do. Look at number three. God's gift releases us from bondage. Now notice. The unbeliever in Christ will die. They'll live in bondage for all of eternity. Think about it. You can't. You are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is in you. And so if something happened right now, let's say you had a terminal stroke. Let's say you passed away. Something happened. I mean, you're gloriously redeemed. And so, you know, the child of God, the Bible makes it very clear, God takes away our sin. God removes our sin from us. I like what the psalm says. Remember, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. Why didn't he say north and south? You know why. If you keep going east, you'll keep going east for a long time. You go west and you'll keep going west for a long time. And so that's exactly. And then, you know, you start to think about it. 
God's plan for man was freedom. Now I want you to notice something. Under, under the third, God's gift of release. Do you realize that Christ in reality reversed what Adam first reversed? Let me say that again. I want you to listen. Christ reversed what Satan reversed. Hold on. Listen carefully. God's plan for man initially was freedom, right? Joy, happiness, tranquility, unity, relationship. Sin, Adam reversed that. Bondage, death. What Adam reversed, Jesus Christ came and he reversed what Adam reversed. That's why whenever you get to the revelation, do you know what the end of the revelation is? Real simple. It is a brand new genesis of the world. We're going all the way back to a brand new genesis. How do you know that? Because you remember in the last book of the Bible, there is a tree of life. Where is the only other place in the Bible the tree of life is mentioned? In Genesis. Why? Because we're going back to a brand new beginning. And so, you know, Christ reversed what Adam reversed. And so, now you still walk in these human bodies, you're going to get old. And by the way, as you get older, as we get more creaks and squeaks about us, don't ever think that it's not the, that God doesn't love us. Sometimes somebody who's aging will say, well, I just don't understand why, why God just don't give me a, a better body. Well, I can tell you why. This body is cursed. Wouldn't we all love to be 33 again? Well, maybe not Mark. Probably, Mark, you're at about 33, right? That'll work, okay. But imagine being back at 33. Imagine being back at that, I don't know what, you know, there's no age in heaven, we won't have to worry about that, but imagine being back at the zenith. Someone said, uh, uh, Dr. Randy Alcorn said that the zenith of your body was between the age of 30 and 33. That's when your cell structure was at its highest. I don't know about that, it sounds logical. But the reality about it is, is, you know, that's what God's going to do. We're released from bondage. And then lastly, real quickly, I want you to notice just the post view of God's grace. If you look at verses 18 through 20, and I won't take time to read it, but I want you to notice three things. Adam's sin made many sinners. In other words, we're all sinners. Watch this. Christ's obedience makes all who repent righteous. Not everybody's righteous, but all those who repent are righteous. Second of all, the law was given to magnify sin in order that God's grace would be magnified greater. Think about it for a moment. What would you do if you were sitting where God's sitting? What would you do to the world? You'd say, give me that red button and I'd just blow everything up. Aren't you glad God is full of grace, full of mercy? Man has been wicked and ungodly and doing all sorts of ungodly things for centuries. We just see it because we're living in this generation. They was doing it 3,000 years ago. They was doing it between the time of Adam and Moses. Men and women were doing abominable things with their bodies just like they are now. But God showed His grace. And so the law was given to magnify sin to show what sin really is. How do I know the speed? I'm a, I'm, you know, I disobey the speed limit or I disobey laws. Just put a law out there. You see, you put a 70 mile speed limit and your car just slows down automatically when it sees that sign, right? I mean, you just go 70. You can go 75 and you get passed up by officials sometimes, don't you? And then thirdly, sin reigned to death. This is the saddest reality. Sin reigns to death in so many people's lives. You know, they don't, they don't want God. They won't allow God into their life. And so sin is reigning. And they think they're having a high old time. But it reigns to the point of that brings death in their life. But watch this. God's grace reigns to eternal life. I look forward to living forever, don't you? I look forward to 100,000 million years from now running as fast as the wind, don't you? You may say, well, I don't like to run. Or just think about that moment when you're caught up to glory. 
You know, your fallen nature is not going to be fallen anymore. Your sinful nature is not going to be sinful anymore. I like what John 1, 4 said in the Living Bible. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about. Eternal life is in him. And this life gives light to all mankind. That's why we can rejoice. Like we ought to say with that song, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed, how? Oh, by works, by going to church a lot, by reading the Bible a whole bunch. No. Redeemed, how? Say it with me. By the blood of the Lamb. And Father, we love you and we praise you. And we just thank you for the privilege to sing the songs that are real. And Lord, we have a real life, a real joy, a real peace. Because we have a real God and we have real forgiveness. And so, Father, we just pray that you would take this word and edge it ever so deep into our heart. And, Father, remind us that that sin reality is in us. But someday it's going to be eradicated and removed and we're going to be permanently and perfectly all you want us to be for all of eternity. We love you and praise you. Now dismiss us with your grace. In Jesus we pray.